Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our final day of the Summer Institute, Building Partnerships and Capacities. I am so honored uh, to be here as your moderator. My name is Bernice Ciproni McLeod. My pronouns are her and she. It is a pleasure um, to be able to present the panelists this morning. But before we start, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Acknowledging land is something Indigenous people have been practicing for generations, long before settlers arrived. Recognizing the land you are on is an expression of respect and gratitude. Officer Local 557 would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat, which is now home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that Toronto is a treaty territory a relationship between the Mississaugas of the Credit and Canada. This land is also part of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the land. Other Indigenous people, settlers, and newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. This means we are all treaty people. As such, it is our responsibility to honour and respect this land and express gratitude for the opportunity to work on and share this land. All my relations. All my relations basically translates to we're all related. It's a reminder that everything in the universe is part of a single whole and is connected in some way to everything else. This means everything and everyone are our relatives and that they have a purpose and are worthy of respect and care, especially the land and each other. Thank you, miigwech, walaliuk, all my relations. Thank you. So it's important to think about uh, the land acknowledgement and think about our relationship with the land. Today, we're going to be talking about relationships with one another. We're going to be talking about partnerships. But as I continue to think about my relationship to the land, I want to reflect on the fact that I have a complex relationship. I am an African Caribbean her or of African Caribbean heritage, and I believe that I have an obligation to honor, respect and sustain this land. I'm a settler, but I also have to pay homage to my Black ancestors who were stolen as slaves and placed on this land that has been cared for by Indigenous people. I need to recognize the resilience of both these peoples that allowed me to be here with you today to learn, to learn with you, to learn from you. So thank you for this opportunity. So the final day, we're going to look back, look forward. It's about building partnerships and capacities, as I said. So the theme of the day will be continuing these important conversations about climate change and our collective responsibilities. Think about our relationship with the land and with one another. We've explored advocacy and activism in the early years. We've examined the key research findings, lessons from the environment and how we can incorporate this research and these learnings into the early years. This also includes thinking about children as capable and competent, recognizing that children can engage in these conversations and in this work in meaningful age appropriate ways. So again, building on partnerships and capacities for change, our expert panels will discuss the importance of building bridges and networks and the fight against climate change and how these can be incorporated into all aspects of the early years from urban planning to the spaces children play in. So as you listen, think about, consider relationships that strengthen your work, partnerships that currently exist and possibilities for the future as we address these important issues. When change needs to take place, it can be best achieved through collective action, which requires strong collaborative partnerships. So at this point, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Isabel Vignet, and she will discuss our partnership um, and some of the work that she's been doing. Thank you so much, Bernice. Uh, nicely said your remarks about, you know, our own relationship with the land. Uh, and I personally learned a lot. Uh, through this conference and I'm looking forward of course for the next uh, panel. Um, you know what I've learned and I must say that, that really I had to step take a step back and and ask myself do I really treat the land with empathy and the respect and uh, um, and I, I'm well as you know indigenous population I've been doing so well and for so long so 
I think we need as models for children to uh, take that step back. And well, for myself, I, I think it's important. Um, so as you may know, the mission of the Center of Excellence is the dissemination of scientific knowledge on early childhood development. And we can only do that if we work in partnerships, really, you know, to make sure that we understand, we, well, we better understand knowledge needs uh, and knowledge gaps. And I must say, after listening to those presentations this week, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, we need to make more space of this, uh, those traditional, uh, traditional knowledge. Uh, we need to be curious about it. Uh, we need to, um, you know, be so respectful. And I really think that the, this knowledge needs to be taken into account in every policies and uh, in the co-designing of our practices together. Uh, so for us, as the Center of Excellence, building partnership over the years really led us to rethink the way we envision and undertake um, the uh, knowledge mobilization activity. Uh, if we are serious about making a difference for children, um, we need to be working hand in hand more together. We need to work in a way we break those silos. You know, so many great work is happening, but then we don't communicate that much or connect that much between um, between each other, I think. Um, so um, those, uh, you know, working with partners also who understand the needs of their audiences in terms of what kind of knowledge in what, you know, in what format that, that knowledge must be dis disseminated. I think this is a way that we cannot on our side alone say we're, we're doing knowledge mobilization or knowledge dissemination if we don't understand, you know, and learn from all expertise uh, in the field. Um, an example of a fruitful uh, partnership is our continued collaborative work with the Atkinson Center. We've been working together for years. Uh, this And this relationship, I may, I may say, is based on trust and respect. And it led us uh, to better understand how to tailor messages in a way they are heard and may be more useful to uh, policymakers and practitioners uh, and early childhood educators, of course. So, uh, and uh, speaking of uh, the importance of partners, uh, both the Atkinson Center and the Center of Excellence are funded by the Lawson Foundation and the Wallace and Margaret McCain Family Foundation. And I must say those are real partners for us. They provide way more than financial support. They provide guidance and they, they challenge us. And I think this is great if we want to make a difference. Um, I now would like to announce that uh, tomorrow, in conclusion of this great conference, most of the distinguished uh, speakers you have heard throughout the conference will be at, well, will be in Montreal and uh, taking part in a roundtable uh, with the objective of drafting a policy brief to be shared in the weeks to come, and we will make sure to keep you posted on that. I am now happy to uh, welcome our special guest today, Lisa Wolf. Lisa is Director of Policy and Research at UNICEF Canada. She's here today to present their latest report entitled, The Future is Now, The Environment and Children's Wellbeing in Canada. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and Isabel and uh, the Atkinson Center. It's a pleasure to be joining you today and sharing some of your valuable time. I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg people in the jurisdiction of the Williams Treaty, just north of Toronto. And um, like Bernice and Isabel, it's uh, prompted me uh, through the report I'm gonna share with you and certainly the uh, Institute this year to think about the environmental disruption uh, caused by settlers on this land and the uneven impacts on children, particularly indigenous and racialized and low income children in this country and the relationships between indigenous sovereignty, environmental sustainability and the well-being of our children. And uh, I think that you'll see that the report card that I'm sharing uh, has some important messages about how we can pursue reconciliation uh, in, in this context. 
Uh, for more than two decades now, uh, the UNICEF Report Card series has compared the performance of the world's richest countries in securing children's rights and advancing their well-being. And we compare wealthy countries because we have similar resources to get the same good outcomes for children. But as you'll see, we don't. So this report card that I'm going to share, the latest one that was just released, uh, measures the impacts of environmental conditions and policies on children and youth under age 18. Uh, I think you'll see that it has a lot to say about our youngest children as well, who are disproportionately vulnerable when the environment is unhealthy. And we hope it contributes to tipping the balance towards children's rights and well-being in the ongoing debates that we are having about environmental protection to put children more squarely in those debates and, uh, and in the trade-offs that we make in terms of environmental protection. So how does Canada compare to its peer countries in protecting and creating environments that sustain children and their well-being? In this report card, environment means the physical aspects of both the natural and built environments that children and youth experience and that have a, a strong impact on their well-being. And we measure aspects of the environment that young people identified as particularly important to them and considering different indications of policy effectiveness from the regulation of toxins to the uh, limiting of greenhouse gas emissions. And we selected the most current and comparable data to measure these things in this report card. Canada's economic and environmental resources, our land, our air, our water, are among the most abundant in the world. So the national expectation should be that Canada's children and youth enjoy one of the highest levels of well-being in one of the cleanest environments in the world. But the report card shows that environmental damage is damaging our children and youth. In our wealthy country, clean water is still out of reach for some children, but some risks like air pollution spread far and wide and affect a lot of young people. The pandemic that they've been enduring, as we all know, has widely disrupted their lives, their early years services, but some have also experienced crises provoked by climate change, like heat domes and wildfires and floods that also disrupt those services and relationships. And environmental degradation is not a future crisis that today's young children are going to have to deal with tomorrow. As this report card shows, the impacts are already clear and present in their minds and bodies. Environmental damage is already costing healthy years of children's lives. And children in the earliest stages of development are particularly vulnerable because their bodies and their immune systems are still developing. Uh, they're at often greater risk during sudden crises and evacuations, and they're going to be living longest with the mounting impacts. And the impacts can start in the prenatal period and continue throughout their lives. They can include low birth weight, infections, asthma, heat stress, poor physical and mental health, diminished cognitive and academic performance, all the way through to cancers and injury and death. So overall, when we pull together the different indicators of the health and well-being of our environment and our children, Canada ranks 28th out of the 39 richest countries in the world. Some of you who follow our UNICEF report card series are used to seeing uh, the Nordic countries in, in the top of the uh, league table rankings. And many of them are there in this report card as well. They are creating some of the better environments for children and youth. And it's not surprising that some highly, um, sorry, newly uh, minted low income countries like Costa Rica struggle to achieve the best environmental income, uh, outcomes for children. These countries uh, that you see um, towards the, the lower rankings in the league table um, are newer to environmental regulation. So there are some um, issues with exposure to toxins in, in these countries. Uh, but they are generally contributing less uh, consumption, less waste, less uh, greenhouse gas emissions to the global ecosystem. And the presence of some relatively richer countries at the bottom of the league table, where Canada finds uh, companions uh, like the US and Australia 
show that national prosperity is no guarantee that children will grow up in a healthy environment. The league table is based on uh, a range of different indicators across the dimensions that you see on the screen. And we have a distribution of better incomes, middling incomes, worse income, uh, sorry, um, indicators and, and outcomes. Uh, about half of the indicators we measure are better than the rich country median and half are worse. And I'm just going to uh, highlight a few examples of these indicators and what they're telling us about uh, our environment and the, the well-being of our children. Uh, so first, what kind of air are children breathing? Uh, we measure ambient air partic uh, particulate pollution, uh, which is released from chemicals and gases. Road traffic is a big contributor. And Canada does fairly well here. We rank eighth uh, overall in terms of ambient air pollution. But after 50 years of regulation to clean the air, our average rate of air pollution exceeds the World Health Organization's safe level. And the majority of children in Canada are exposed to unhealthy air. They are more vulnerable to air pollution than adults because they have smaller lung capacity, less well-developed immune systems, and they're closer to the ground where pollution accumulates. And prenatal exposure can increase the, the likelihood of lower birth weight and respiratory infections like asthma in early childhood. It may also affect children's neurological and cognitive development. And even more concerning, when we look at the uh, impact on children's health of air pollution, uh, we rank 29th in the level of morbidity attributed to air pollution in, in terms of years of um, lost healthy lives. And uh, why is Canada more vulnerable um, to the health impacts of air pollution? We're not sure, but one ex uh, explanation could be that Canada has more cars per capita, more than a third of Canadians live near a major roadway, and we have a higher rate of child poverty than many of the top performing countries. Uh, so children in lower income um, situations tend to have, for instance, more severe asthma, requiring more hospitalization. Those could be some explanations, uh, but certainly we have disproportionate health impacts on children from um, air pollution. Similarly, the impact of unsafe water. Uh, we have in Canada, uh, a, the third largest reserve of fresh water in the world, about a quarter of the world's fresh water supply. Rather than topping the league table, we rank 24th in the loss of healthy years of life due to unsafe water. And only the Eastern European countries and new, new high income countries like Mexico and Colombia fall behind Canada. Exposure to toxicants in air and water, food, soil, products children use are still a concern uh, in Canada after years of regulation and some progress that we've made in protecting children from toxicants. And young children eat and drink more relative to their body weight compared to adults. And again, their immune systems, their livers, their kidneys are uh, less effective at removing these kinds of toxins. Uh, and an infant is particularly um, vulnerable to toxic elements like pesticides and herbicides. So it's a concern that children in Canada are more exposed to pesticides than many of their rich country peers. This is unfinished business, intoxicant regulation. Uh, similarly with lead poisoning, um, like we've had uh, some progress in protecting children from lead, but we still have 1.6% uh, of children uh, with a level of blood in uh, le level of lead in their blood that is uh, considered poisonous, and there is no safe level of lead. And we have children coming into Canada from other countries where lead exposure is particularly high. So young children, young uh, immigrants to Canada with higher levels of lead exposure and uh, symptoms of lead poisoning to be aware of uh, as well. So again, an unfinished business. Access to green space is another thing we looked at. And uh, we know that it's, uh, I think there's wider recognition now that it's critical to children's health and development and, and their well-being broadly. It's linked to a very long list of positive outcomes. Uh, and it has the salutary effect of protecting children from air and noise pollution and some of the other indicators in this report card. 
and from urban heat. Uh, so a good question is, you know, how is Canada doing? Is, is the grass greener here uh, than on the other sides of our border? Um, we rank 15th in the urban green space index. And what we're seeing is that in Canada, most of our urban centers are experiencing a, a steady decline in greenness. And this mainly stems from planning and political decisions. So it's avoidable. Uh, and, and we're also seeing that access to green space maps, like many of the other indicators in this report card, to income and racial inequalities. In fact, some uh, lower income neighborhoods are used as buffers between wealthier neighborhoods and heavy traffic zones or um, urban gray areas. And places children frequent, like childcare and schools, are not typically prioritized for urban greening projects. Traffic is another aspect of children's local environments um, that is worrisome. It's one of the leading causes of child injury and death in Canada and across rich countries. And it contributes to the loss of green space and free outdoor play that children need to thrive. It also contributes to air pollution and urban heat. And uh, what we see in this league table is Sweden, that was the first to uh, establish Vision Zero, which is an ambitious goal to uh, eliminate um, road traffic injuries and death, is at the top of the league table. So it works. And in Canada, we have you know various um, levels in our communities of, of commitment to Vision Zero, but it's not yet. Uh, seeing the kinds of outcomes um, that some of the better performing countries have been able to achieve. And this is evident of, in our rank of 23rd. And in this case, the burden is very high with 119 lost years of healthy life per thousand children. And as with uh, green space, uh, distance from traffic arteries is really not uh, typically a consideration in citing early year centers or schools where children frequent. So finishing up with the broader ecosystem in which children live and, and um, in, you know, in, in which they need to thrive, resource consumption and the attendant waste and emissions uh, that rich countries are contributing um, and do so far more than lower, uh, lower income countries do. Uh, is currently exceeding the Earth's capacity to sustain a healthy and balanced ecosystem. So is it any wonder that children's health is paying a price? Children are canaries in, in the coal mine of, of our broader ecosystem health. And here we can only conclude that Canada is a rich country, but a poor global citizen, because of all the countries in the report card, we have the worst ranking for waste production, the second worst ranking for resource consumption, and the third worst ranking for greenhouse gas emissions, which you can see in these league tables. So the report card really is inviting all of us to consider is Canada's progress to protect the environment and our children enough? The choices we're making today are going to decide if children face a lifetime and perpetual crisis of one type or another, or a greener and safer and healthier future. And one of the most effective ways to make progress is to increase the child sensitivity of our policies, all of our policies, including environmental policies and strategies. So we're calling on all levels of government to apply a distinct child and youth impact lens to their policy making, including environmental policies, giving children priority consideration. One application of this would be to improve the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which is currently uh, subject to a bill uh, in the Senate proposing reforms. But we need to strengthen children's unqualified right to an environment that is healthy for them in this bill. And we should be requiring impacts on diverse young people um, in this bill, not just if it seems like it's a good idea um, you know, based on, on the, um, the application of the bill. And another key opportunity for all of us is to think about the um, environmental disaster uh, reduction and mitigation plans that are emerging in communities and provinces, territories, even federally now. Children and youth are currently almost invisible in these plans, including their services, the earlier services, childcare, 
how can early years services be considered in these plans? How can they adapt? How can we plan for continuity during disasters? And how can we make these services a priority for restoration? So I'm just going to end with um, a, a word from our young people, giving them the last word. They haven't given up on the planet or on us, so let's not give up on them. A letter to Canada from the young leaders of today. We are already seeing the effects of climate change on people and the environment. And it will only worsen in years to come. Climate change disproportionately affects young people while we are among the least responsible for its impacts. Climate change impacts people all around the world and even across the country differently. In the north, we are seeing flying permafrost. On the west coast, we are seeing heat waves, wildfires, and floods. In the prairies, unpredictable weather. On the east coast, sea levels rising and hurricanes. We are not giving in to apathy. We see climate change for what it is. An emergency. emergency. We know we will never achieve a perfect world now, but as young people, we will never stop fighting for a better future. To the adult allies and decision makers, we ask, are you with us? Katie Yu, Carol Nelson, Ella Bradford. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share that report card and you can find it at unicef.ca. Uh, so uh, many thanks to all of you for having me. Thank you, Lisa. Um, that was absolutely riveting um, and demonstrates the urgency of this work and the importance of these conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm is inspiring that you ended with uh, the children and giving them a voice, which I hope we can do more of and certainly be what we'll consider as we listen to our panelists. Um, so just a couple of things before I introduce our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, we have disabled the chat box, but if you have questions, we invite you to use the Q&A um, and so that we will be able to respond. So each panelist, we have three of them, will present for approximately 15, 20 minutes each, and then we'll follow up with a question and answer period. So again, we invite you to post those questions in the Q&A. So it is my honor to first introduce Ian Masrat, who is project leader of child nature at IVN Nature Education Connections. And uh, or, sorry, at IVN Nature, where education and connections are made between children and nature, where they learn about nature, their own physical possibilities, cooperation, and imagination. His involvement in the support of child development has made Ian active in many initiatives, allowing children to play learn, exercise, meet, and relax outdoors. There's um, a long list of wonderful work that he's involved in, and I'm gonna encourage you to read our brochure for more details. Um, I'd like to also introduce uh, Nason Saba, who is Manager of Engagement Partnerships with the World Bank Group. Nason serves as Manager of Engagement and Partnerships at the World Bank Group before joining the bank in Washington, DC in January, 2020. He was the UN Environment Program's Global Communication Director for six years, based in Kenya. Prior to that, he held various roles with UNICEF and WHO, World Health Organization, and beginning as a consultant and communication officer with the Global Polio Eradication Initiative in the Horn of Africa and India, and then working on communication for development programs at the state and national levels for UNICEF India, and finally as Chief Communication Advocacy and Participation and partnerships at UNICEF Mozambique. Again, I encourage you to read more in our brochure to learn about his exciting work. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Debbie Wilson Denard, who is traditional knowledge practitioner and life promotion ambassador. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health, University of Toronto, and Union Star Consulting Life Teachings Lodge. Dr. Debbie Wilson Denard is Anishinaabe traditional knowledge practitioner, I hope I pronounced that correctly, visual and performance artist, lecturer, writer, water protector, life promotion ambassador, and Sturgeon clan member from the Rainy River First Nation. Growing up, she was raised with her grandmother's love and commitment to sharing traditional Anishinaabek teaching and way of life. And again, um, much more to read and, and 
to uh, understand and to appreciate all of her work and our brochure. So I'm going to start uh, with Dr. Denard and um, hand the floor over to you and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Hey, Coach Bernice, can you hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> I felt really emotional after uh, watching that video, um, the kids speaking. So as I forgot I was speaking first, but now I'm just a little bit like, okay. I'm gonna start with a smudge. And I'm also gonna time myself because I tend to um, start thinking something and um, speaking for a long time. So what I'm gonna do here is, um, and I can't, I have my, my environmentally sustainable um, mini frying pan here. So you might have seen a smudge um, in a shell, but there be, there came a time when you know shells are still something, so I guess over resourced, um, for lack of a better word. So I'm just going to start um, by offering this uh, this smudge for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> virtual smudging is always a challenge, um, but it's a way to, um, <clears throat> I guess, sort of come into this present moment, acknowledging this medicine um, that we have. <clears throat> so I'm going to start this way and introduce myself as well. Nindue Maganudo, Nyokwane Bikinugo, Name Do Dam, Nishinaube. The day one Quayan Dow. Manitoba watch on and Dong Jean and Dabari Nongong. I'm very happy to be able to spend um, the next few minutes um, <clears throat> sharing what little bit I know. My introduction talked about my grandmother. And um, the challenge that I have, I think, in, in, um, you know, just listening to everything and thinking about what it is for our children, not just for the next generation following us, but, um, you know, Anishinaabe worldview is about those seven generations. Um, and in our creation story, which is something that is such a challenge because without a cultural context or understanding, of Anishinaabe worldview without an understanding of Anishinaabe Moin, our language, it's difficult to sometimes translate into the present moment the ideas and the thinking around what does that mean to for, for myself also even to be invited into this space because I'm constantly reminded that <clears throat> for several generations, um, our people were silenced, our people were forced onto the reserve system and you know weren't allowed to actually leave the reserve until 1960. So what I, what I sometimes see that I'm experiencing is um, in this moment, we are experiencing the decisions, we are living the consequences of those decisions of those first colonizers, those first settlers who, who brought with them this, um, their own value systems, their own attitudes, their own, and, and in fact, their own creation stories. And how those creation stories were imposed on us as Anishinaabe people, but continue to be imposed on us as people continuing to live here. In fact, that desire of those first settlers seeking that good life, um, unfortunately meant taking our good life away as the original people here. And what I heard and want to acknowledge um, again, and it, this isn't the first time I've heard, but I want to acknowledge um, Bernice, <clears throat> also what you mentioned earlier, like not only did the colonizers come here looking for a good life displacing the original people of this land, but they also displaced people from other parts of the land to ensure that 
Um, I know that it's not just your community. I've also um, I've had these conversations, um, not with every settler who is forced to come here to support that um, vision, um, but secondly, to acknowledge um, also those ones who were brought here and forced to build the railroad and be in internment camps. So I do, I do acknowledge all of those, um, those people who are, are continuing to live that, but I just want to acknowledge you because um, it is something that I think about and how that affects us and, and what does that mean in the present moment? In thinking about um, who's coming behind us, I, I wanted to, you know, I want to talk a little bit about our moss bag teaching. So I, and our, our Tikkanagan and um, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna blur my background here. So what I have, so instead of a slide presentation, I actually have my my first son's um, chicken organs to demonstrate this. So people might have seen this um, this item. So this is what we put our our children in after um, they're in a moss bag, which is a, a soft version. I'm hoping you have an opportunity to. Um, I guess it's Googleable, uh, the moss bag and the uh, Tikkanagan. But in this Tikkanagan, you know, really, it's a it's the physical evidence of our of our own way of belief, those original teachings that we were given. And in this Tikkanagan, it the way that it's tied actually. So I introduced that I am a sturgeon clan. So our clan system was our governance system, and it's actually represented in the tying. So you could look at this, this is the, I guess the physical memory of, of knowing the teaching of the Tikkanagan, for example, teaches you, oh yeah, we have a clan system, crane clan, loon clan, deer clan, bear clan, eagle or bird clan, um, marten clan, and finally the fish clan, which is actually represented down here as the mediator. But even in this item, you'll see a, there's a space here, and that talks about where the spirit of life, and it's connected to that soft spot on, on the top of our heads when we're born. So, you know, and I think even about the simple technology that was developed to carry our children, you know, there's the purpose of that, and if you see it, I'll put it over here, so you know, it stands up. And part of that is, you know, being in relation and connection with the family, but it, it's a place where you're, um, you know, you're, I know it sounds funny that, you know, say in English, you know, we tie up our children because, you know, could, <laughs> could have people thinking other things of how we're tying up our children, but uh, this is the most kindest way of showing you that tying up our children um, what that means in uh, Anishinaabe thinking isn't the same as it might be in uh, English. We do tie up our children, but this is the way we tie up our children. Um, and what does that mean? That means that they, they have, we have an opportunity to observe. We have an opportunity to spend that time um, being in relationship and connection with our families and, and not, I guess, in some ways having that mobilization. So even before colonization, before people came here, the simple technology and understanding, and if you notice even this part on the front, this is just in case. Um, so already, I, if, even the simple, you know, you could call it ancient, or you could call it some archaic sort of technology, but you know, when you really, um, when you really think about all of the teachings and how it reminds us, oh yeah, we have a clan system. It's our whole governance structure. Yes, it's child centered. Um, and so that's how, I, how I've come to understand why colonization worked because as we know, uh, removing the children and preventing um, people from speaking language, um, having ceremonies, um, living their own creation story, um, colonization worked in our communities to a devastating effect that you'll see some of that 
the consequences of that being the social determinants of health. So one of the things that, you know, I have to, I guess, as my, my thinking towards what is it that I could share today? So one of, one of the things I, I guess I start thinking about is um, how, will, how will we question our own, how we're living here in our own creation story? I was happy to also, you know, how are we living the land acknowledgement? How do we relate um, to our own selves as the ones um, bringing that support and knowledge um, for the children? And our way of thinking as Anishinaabe, I'm going to use my feather, um, you know, this being the lodge of life, we come into this physical realm. And that first life is that good life when everything's taken care of. And then as we grow older and our teeth, our baby teeth fall out, we move into that next stage of life, which is the fast life. And there's ceremonies and um, traditional practices throughout our whole life cycle until we we finally leave this, until we finally leave this lodge of life. But in this example, what I'm saying, um, my grandmother, I'll just use her. <laughs> my grandmother walked this path ahead of me. My, my grandmother is no longer here in this lodge of life. She transitioned um, to that next place. So in our Anishinaabe way of thinking, the future is behind us. The future is behind us following in our footsteps, just like we follow in the footsteps of someone who came before us. So we really need to, I think, start thinking about what does that mean when the future is coming behind us for seven generations? The, um, the ability for me to even have some of these material items from my ancestors who went through, who walked ahead of me, and we talk about that in, as in terms of intergenerational trauma. So what is it like to be um, part of a history and, and family? What is it like to be parented by residential school survivors? What is it like to um, be part of those systems like uh, 60, even being parented by 60 scoop survivors? So we've been working, you know, most recently, I would say even only in the the past 10 years that reclamation and unfortunately only really since the TRC report came out. So I feel like even as Anishinaabe people, we also need time. We need time. So, you know, we talk about the richness right now. It is true at one time Anishinaabe and Endemo and Anishinaabe way of being was very rich here in this part of Turtle Island. And we, we are um, also at a time, unfortunately, that we are depleted like the earth. We are depleted like the land. And we do need to be able to have time in our own sovereignty and, aut and autonomy to regain and strengthen that before we're, we're asked to continually um, come and commit to other people. Um, and that's the challenge. So I'm, I'm not saying, uh, don't ask us as to those ones of us that are able, very small percentage of people who are able to have um, the honor to have, be able for me to be able to share this teaching or to know the moss bag teaching. Not everybody had that opportunity because as we know, the past three to four generations, people were forced to put that learning down. And they put that down for the safety of those ones coming behind them. They put those down because they were afraid. And so what I'm asking is to be mindful of the communities and the people that you might be approaching to ask to support you um, in your areas. And, um, and also not to take up that work yourself. <laughs> um, even a smudging is a ceremony. And um, to be mindful that even though I'm also saying, try not to extract so much resources from traditional people, but to find that balance too, not to take it upon ourselves to also perform those ceremonies that are sacred to our communities. I'm also not saying not to do it privately. So I just had a recent issue with 
something that happened in the high school um, with my with my child. <laughs> I was reflecting on that. Um, so I was trying to tell the teacher, you know, if you want to do that practice at home, but as a settler nation with my with my child there, please don't do that ceremony. Um, invite somebody there. Um, I never thought of that before, but I'm just I'm just reminding people of that because oh, instead of building relationships, like well, I don't know any Nishnabe people, or I don't, you know, we have to develop those. So instead of saying, oh, we don't know, we haven't built those, we haven't had, and it's true as a nation, we haven't had time to develop those relationships. Um, but we also haven't had time to develop that ourselves as, as in, we are still also recovering um, from the impacts of colonization. Oh, that's, how, well, that's why I time myself. I'm really happy to continue to have, um, to continue to listen um, <clears throat> to some of the solutions um, that will be presented. I'm actually, Ian, I'm actually excited to hear about your work that's happening in other parts of the country. So this was, uh, in my reverse fashion, this was my, my, um, my thinking about that the children are watching. And um, this, that, that thinking came out of, um, being in a school where it said the elders were watching and that that felt a really um again kind of that patriarchy <laughs> sort of lens so um all of my thinking today was about the children are watching so we have to be the ones as the adults responsible we are visioning the future for them uh, whatever engagement we choose to do in relationship but we have to uh and I, you know, I did appreciate Isabel saying that earlier that you know you've 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 started that thinking about your own relationship to the land. So how do we extend that land acknowledgement? But well, we first have to do it from ourselves and have that. So the homework, because I don't have twenty minutes, I would have just given this homework. And you know, we are teaching space, so the homework that I'm going to ask you to do is is um, at some time to simply go sit with the land, go sit on the lap of our mother, the earth, for 20 minutes, no phone, just observe. What is it that you see? What is it that she's trying to tell you? Um, that first time is just to practice your observation, be in relationship with her first before asking our children to develop relationships that we might not have had the opportunity to have ourselves. Um, the next time you go sit in that same place again for 30 minutes, just thinking about what is that, how did the environment change you? The last time finding another place, all oh, the same place maybe to sit for one hour and to do a self-reflection on how did I change this land? And I think that, you know, once we're able to get even to answer those questions for ourselves, um, being able to engage those young people that are coming behind us, we're already, we're setting ourselves in a really good spot uh, to be those ones standing up and to be those ones that, that they are watching. So miigwech for listening. Timmy. Thank you so much, Dr. Denard. That was really powerful. and. Uh, it, yeah, it really touched me on many levels. And when you and I'm going to try not to get emotional myself, but um, yeah, I appreciate um, you know what you're saying about relationship and relationship to the land and each other and your own sharing your own um, story um, and and thinking about your grandmother and the teachings uh, really resonated. Uh, um, I was talking to my mother yesterday, thinking about my grandmother and how all the women in my family used to carry a little bottle of tincture it was, you know, different plants and herbs that they, they would brew up and, and use for every ailment. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate what you're saying. So thank you for that. So our, our next um, speaker is um, Ian Masrat, and uh, we, um, again, have the privilege of listening and learning from uh, his work. And I see you're all set to go. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, good morning, I think. 
still morning in Canada. <laughs> um, yeah, I am uh, Ian Mostert. I live in uh, the Netherlands, Rotterdam, and uh, yeah, I would like to tell you some more about our experience in uh, our city, about our concept of the green blue schoolyards. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but before I will uh, tell you a lot of uh, yeah, stories and experiences in uh, our city. Uh, normally, uh, I walk through a, a hall with people and uh, I like some more interaction. Today, it's not possible, uh, but I will try something. Um, I would like to ask you to uh, yeah, imagine you were about five, six years old again. Go back in your uh, time as a child. Close your eyes and uh, you're a, a young uh, girl or boy again. And uh, the summer holiday will start and try to imagine what you were doing, please. Okay, normally I would like to ask everyone in the, in the room what they were imagining and I don't think it's possible to have some interaction today, but maybe something in the chat. Um, I would like to fill in some stories. I think uh, many stories are about uh, playing in nature playing together with your friends uh, going outside uh, not inside and many stories i hear is climbing trees or jumping over water or making uh, a soup with some uh, leaves and flowers and mud and uh, some uh, children uh, play risky or some uh, children are yeah, doing some uh, I, I don't know the good word, but mischief things. So a little, little uh, naughty, but many of uh, that's the the story of the young children are about that playing in nature and making your own fantasy games, etc. And I would like to go to to the next sheet, please. And. What I like to uh, discuss is uh, what we are, what are we doing uh, when we are uh, parents or what are we doing when we are professionals? Do we still remember those stories and uh, do we take care of the children to take our responsibility to give them uh, the same nice experiences as we had as a child? and. Uh, is there the, the, the space for the children in the cities? The cities are more, uh, more and more uh, dense, uh, more crowded, more stone, more uh, traffic. How can we still take our responsibility for the children and their, uh, yeah, their environment and their uh, development? Um, I, I would like to show you something uh, in uh, Rotterdam. And I will also show you the, the contrast or the, the paradox in the world we are living in. Um, yeah, the next uh, sheet, please. What I see in uh, the Netherlands is uh, yeah, the environment we uh, give to the children is stony deserts with iron and, and not too many nature. Uh, you can be dirty or you, it, it could be uh, dangerous. Um, we also tell them where to play, how to play. This part you, you can see uh, on the, the right uh, photo. Uh, there you have to climb, there you can go down, there you have to do this, there you have to do that. And that is the environment we give children. And it's really easy because of uh, uh, it's uh, we are in control and everything is fixed before with the uh, insurance etc uh, so we yeah uh, we don't like risks as adults and it's also uh, cost uh, the costs are really low when you have uh, just stones or just some grass 
but uh, we thought this is not the, the environment where children can grow up and uh, it's really crowded. There's no space to play. The only places to play are playgrounds of the, the schoolyards, I'm sorry. Okay, next sheet, please. Um, about 16 years ago, it was a, yeah, Rotterdam was a really rough city with a, you know, criminality, with uh, 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 drugs uh, abuse, uh, yeah, lots of things. It was uh, sometimes a little dangerous and we were looking how can we make the city more child friendly and uh, how can we make policy for uh, housing, etc. The, there were some building blocks for the in, in the policy, and uh, we can go to the next sheet. And the one of the building blocks is also the the public squares and the schoolyards. And uh, you know, in this case, we are focusing on the schoolyards. You can see here the, the stony deserts, and yeah, behind you see also the the housing. Uh, many houses just have about uh, two or three uh, rooms, sometimes with big uh, families, sometimes with five, six families. And because of the, the risk or the danger outside, uh, some children are uh, walking around and they uh, yeah, could have some problems with the older youth. Some of them were also dealing drugs when they were about 10 years, 12 years, etc. And the children who uh, you know, the, the parents take more care of them to keep them safe, they got an isolement uh, because of their staying inside in their small houses and behind the door, it's really crowded with their own family. So there could also be some more problems. Um, okay, next sheet, please. Yeah, here you can can see some uh, pictures. We also have used a lot of uh, data. Uh, where live uh, where live the families, the children? How many uh, outdoor space do they have? How many green spaces there, etc. And so it was easy to uh, yeah make policy on the neighborhoods where to focus on. And what you also saw is uh, people who become some more uh, wealthy they left the city but yeah that's not what you want the city must be for everyone okay next sheet please so um we were looking looking how can we uh, use the outdoor space more multifunctional uh, at uh, school times you can create an uh, yeah, what's the name, the, the kind of learning landscape. And after schools, it, it could be uh, open for the neighborhood to play, to exercise, to meet each other. And um, yeah, this was just a start. And it, here you can see just some grass, but uh, each year it was be uh, yeah, bigger, more risky, more fun. So. I will show you in a little movie uh, after a couple of uh, sheets. <clears throat> okay, can we go to the next one, please? Um, the concept of the green, of the green blue schoolyards is uh, yeah, a, a kind of a multifunctional uh, uh, that policy integrated uh, concept. Uh, the money comes from the climate adaptation, of adaptation, but we focus on the health and well-being of children. We also focus on uh, ed education, and we also focus on uh, biodiversity. And uh, before before uh, school can uh, start, uh, we have also have a go no go. We uh, talk about the total concept with them and. Uh, then we uh, choose uh, five schools each year. Okay, next sheet, please. Um, we also have learned some uh, lessons. It's really easy to make uh, a subsidy and uh, give some money, but what we also saw is the uh, school 
principals and teachers, uh, they must be helped. It's uh, not their um, uh, core business. The core business is uh, education and uh, not uh, creating green spaces, outdoor, etc. So we organize with a team to uh, avoid what you can uh, read here. And it's really difficult for uh, many teachers. They don't have um, much time, so we uh, help them uh, from the beginning. And they can still call me also. It's eight years ago. Okay, and next year, please. Um, this is the way we working now. Uh, the most important thing is uh, talking about uh, the vision. What is your vision? Why should you want uh, the green and blue uh, schoolyard? And uh, we ask them how to use it uh, in school time uh, as a uh, learning landscape and how they uh, give it to the neighborhood because of when you invest public money, how can you give the, the space to the public? And we also organize uh, the, the maintenance uh, uh, program and uh, we develop the concept uh, year in, year out. Okay, we can go to the next one. The most important uh, question or the, the most important focus, I think, is uh, what's the pers perspective of the child? And uh, not only how to develop the environment, but also uh, the policy or <clears throat> avoiding risks, etc. We just bring the uh, adults back to what's the child's perspective, what is good for them, not for you. And uh, that's the focus. Okay, go to the next one. And here I show some pictures. We uh, bring the children, but also the teachers, the parents, some uh, neighbors uh, to inspiring spa uh, spaces and we tell them these spaces you can bring back to your own neighborhood or how would you like to have an, uh, uh, a holiday how could you bring back the nice experience of your holiday into your own neighborhood or how can you bring the nice experiences of the age of five six years uh, to your neighborhood Many of those experiences are like what you see here. It's really simple, but you have to uh, yeah, give some space to um, make your own fantasy games. And we can also go to the next uh, sheet. And uh, it's also really important to play with uh, some uh, loose parts, like stones or uh, uh, wood. Uh, we also bring a lot of uh, fluidy water. Children like to play with the water and it's also good for the climate. And next sheet, please. Uh, what we would like, like to uh, bring the children is also some more uh, freedom to, to feel freely when they're playing. Sometimes also with the uh, bit of mischief, we have to tolerate that. Um, okay, next sheet, please. And a um, really important thing, uh, I don't know the, the question you or the, the experiences you had, but uh, when I asked uh, the, the question about the experience when you were about five, six years old, many times I hear uh, nature experiences or playing outdoors, uh, making your own uh, games. Uh, when I ask this question to people between 20 or 30 years old. I hear I played football or we were playing computer games. So then you hear you can uh, change now or there's a generation they don't have uh, the experience to play outdoor with nature in nature. So they're losing the contact. Many people just live in the city and don't know anymore. Okay. Next sheet, please. Uh, yeah, here you can see some uh, policy back backgrounds. Um, yeah, the, the, 
uh, I think the presentation start with the silos of uh, policy, and we put some uh, silos uh, together in uh, practice, and uh, the money comes from the, the climate change uh, uh, policy, which we also bring the uh, the health, the education, uh, the biodiversity and child-friendly policy together, just focused on uh, schoolyards. And what I uh, experience is that uh, uh, yeah, people from the municipality like it to collaborate on something. Um, what's the English word? As sense sense making work. They also like their work more because of they are not just working on uh, climate change, but they see uh, what uh, changes in the neighborhood. Okay. Next sheet, please. Now here you can see also the, the background of the uh, climate adaptation uh, policy with the uh, rain, the heat, the drought, uh, flood, groundwater, and the subsidence. Is that a good English word? I hope. But uh, because of the climate change, many things uh, changes. And what you see here is the city of Rotterdam with the harbor. And uh, Okay, next sheet, please. Um, yeah, here you can see the, the things which is important for the, for the schools. And I already told it, but only the, the soil quality is uh, uh, really new the last years, also for the health of the children. Okay, next sheet, please. Um, we uh, invest a lot of time in the go no go uh, period. We would like to uh, ask the schools about their vision, and we will also tell them uh, where they starting with. Many times, uh, people have a romantic uh, view. Uh, and dancing through the roses in the own neighborhood, but uh, you also have to do some maintenance or you have to uh, have some uh, uh, knowledge about uh, trees or, um, for example. And another part is uh, we also focus on the location. So you saw the climate uh, adaption uh, uh, policy, but at the next sheets, you will see some uh, other parts. So here you can see the, the blue label. You can see uh, with data where the problems with uh, fluid and uh, water is. Uh, you can also see the places where uh, most stony uh, neighborhoods are. There's also a social index and we focus on uh, the neighborhoods without a lot of money. People who cannot go to the greener spaces or don't have space outdoor. Uh, we also have a child-friendly uh, index and we look at the uh, postal codes with, with uh, many children and less outdoor space. So the pressure on the outdoor space will be bigger. So we have to create some more space. And we have also an index about uh, the fiscal health like uh, obese. So we also would like to create some more space where children are uh, bigger and uh, move less. Okay, we can go to the next one. <clears throat> Here you can see the five uh, criteria we are discussing with the school. And uh, in the beginning, we also tell the schools they, when they participate in the concept, they have to do the whole concept, not just one part. And we also tell them when they start uh, the concept, they must be the ambassador to the next uh, school. Uh, that, that's a really important thing. About uh, 12, 14 years ago, uh, I was in uh, meetings with the principals of uh, schools and they were uh, yeah, really negative about uh, schoolyards, but they 
didn't have uh, any experience or uh, knowledge. So we must uh, create some successes with them. And to the next sheet and yes. Uh, maybe more interesting than my story is just a short movie. So you can see the children and that's where it's all about. We zien uh, allemaal uh, mooie klanten. We hebben dit uh, samen met ons uh, groep gecreëerd en ook met de andere klassen. En het is best wel mooi geworden. Dit is ons nieuwe plein, een nieuw plein van Kindcentrum De Vlinder. Wij hebben dat van de gemeente in beheer gekregen. En daardoor konden wij het middenstuk van het plein helemaal zelf inrichten. Dat hebben we gedaan samen met de kinderen en samen met de buurtbewoners. En ja, de kinderen wilden zand, wilden modder, wilden water. En de buurt wilde graag bloemen en planten en dat het er mooi uitzag. Je bent hier in Dordrecht op het groen-blauwe schoolplein van de Bavingsschool. Het plein was hiervoor helemaal betegeld. Er was niks aan. Er werd dus vooral veel gerend en ook wel aardig wat onrust heerste er dan. Gewoon omdat kinderen zich verveelden. We hadden heel veel plassen in de herfst en in de winter op het plein. Toen hebben we met het schoolpleinadvies een plan gemaakt, ook met de kinderen samen. Van wat hebben we nodig, wat vinden we leuk, wat willen we graag op het plein. We hebben nu dus een klimaatadaptief plein. Er gebeuren meer lessen buiten, dus we hebben een insectenhotel, er komt een moestuin. We zijn op het schoolplein van de Margrietschool in Rotterdam, in Blijdorp. Nou, mijn zoontje, Seven, die zit hier op school. Maar we wonen hier ook om de hoek. Dus ook na schooltijd gaat hij heel vaak met uh, kinderen uit de buurt, met zijn buurjongens, uh, hier naartoe om hier uh, lekker te spelen. En ik ben er eigenlijk zelf ook regelmatig. De wanen zich echt in de natuur. En dat is ook eigenlijk de bedoeling dat uh, kinderen op de schoolplein ook in een natuurlijke omgeving zitten. Eerst was het gewoon hier oud hier en dan alleen maar glijbaar en de klimmerij. Dus dat vonden wij het niet zo leuk en groen staat mooier bij overal. Dus daarom vonden we het beter. Gewoon verbeteren, net als ons. Heel veel groen en minder stenen. Hallo, we zijn hier op een bijzondere kwekerij waar wij inheemse wilde planten en struiken kweken. Okay. Shall we do the last sheets? And I don't know how much time we had or have. Okay, now, uh, last uh, part of uh, my story. Um, it's really important to uh, let of to to participate all together uh, to uh, create uh, spaces. We have experiences with uh, spaces where uh, yeah, youngsters were dealing drugs, etc., or with a lot of uh, rubbish on the on the square. And when you let everyone participate in their space and not the space of the municipality or whatever, they will take care of it and they uh, feel responsible. Also, when it's uh, the playground of their younger brothers and sisters. So uh, we organized it together with the children, with the uh, parents, with the uh, teachers. And uh, now you can see here some pictures how we uh, developed some things. And we let the children collaborate with the developer and the, uh, the greenkeeper. Okay, and we can go to the next one. And what I also love is the children uh, understand how some things uh, work in the big world. When you have a vision and an ID, and you organize and mobilize, uh, mobilize uh, budget, you can develop your own space, your own world, and uh, have some influence on your uh, well being. Um, here you can see. Uh, one of the schoolyards we uh, uh, did with the children. 
think maybe there's another sheet I'm forgotten. Uh, here's some examples. Yeah. Left, uh, you can see the that picture I showed you in the beginning. In the other pictures, you can see how the this uh, playground is becoming. And the next one is also. Uh, this was a really yeah, stony, unfriendly uh, place. And after that, it was a lovely uh, space in the middle of the city center. Okay, maybe there's a next one. Now it's funny to to collaborate with the children. They they have a lot of fun and they learn a lot. And after a while, it's uh, their space and they're uh, discovering many things. And uh, the picture uh, on the the right side, it's also uh, for me a nice experience. It was the first time the water went on, and uh, the day before the the little children of the kindergarten uh i've have seen a picture about a big wall the the to yeah what's the english name uh, to keep the water together uh, between the mountains uh, i'm forgotten the name i'm sorry uh, but only because of that picture they were building their own dam and uh they were discussing how to organize it. The, the big stones could uh, uh, keep the water uh, there, but the water uh, flood between the stones. This, so they need some sand and the sand was flowing away and they were really heavy uh, learning together. And it's yeah, many lessons are learned outside in their own neighborhood. Um, yeah, at, at last, at this time, we are looking at the concept also uh, to develop it more like the uh, the first thousand days of a child. So we are looking to uh, make it more public also for the youngs, youngest uh, children and their uh, families. And uh, we uh, organize more the green living uh, neighborhoods, of a living room for the neighborhoods. So it must be open uh, every time. Okay. Um, now, if there are some questions, maybe we have some time uh, later this uh, this moment. But for now, I keep it back with this. Thank you, Ian. That was perfect timing, um, and that was really uh, interesting. What really um, struck me was uh, I love this language of mischief of children making mischief and being naughty as I think about play. And I, and uh, I think, you know, if we want to capture children's voices, it's that it's those naughty, you know, mischievous voices that lend themselves to the most creative kind of um, thinking and planning and where we really um, honor and, and capture the needs of the children. I really love that you said that, you know, the, when we think about partnerships and we think about building these spaces, creating these spaces, it's really about putting children at the center of that, which has been the theme so far this morning. So uh, thank you for much, so much for, for illustrating how that can be done and, and the possibilities that happens through these partnerships. And again, when children's voices are heard. So we have one more uh, speaker um, that we are again fortunate to learn from and with, um, Nason. Um, Really look forward to hearing what you have to say and uh, learning again from your expertise. So Nason Saba will uh, take us through to the next uh, final presentation. And then there'll be an opportunity for questions. Um, and again, to remind you to use the chat box. And then after um, that, we will have an award, a brief award ceremony that we ask you to stay on for um, as we honor and recognize some of the work of our colleagues. So take it away, Nason. Thank you so much, Bernice. You can hear me okay? All right, great. Well, let me let me start with, I suppose, three three apologies. One, um, you know, two incredibly hard and inspiring presentations to follow. So apologize if I if I 
if I now put you to sleep, but but lunch is around the corner, at least for those of you in, in Canada. I don't know about Ian. Secondly, I'm I'm neither an ECD specialist nor an environmental specialist. Um, but I suppose as someone who's um, worked in, in those spaces, at least uh, marginally, um, I, I understand that when you are completely ignorant, um, partnerships really save you. So I suppose that's one one logic for, for, for me being here. And a third apology is really, I again, I will now kind of sort of uh, present more of a, uh, of a of a global view, a view of the world at large. I, I am a Canadian. I haven't lived in Canada for, for 22 years now. Um, and, and my work over the past couple of decades really has been at different levels, but in, in, in different countries and regions, and most recently at global level at the UN and at the World World Bank Group. But I hope certainly in light of some of the um, the, the metrics that uh, that Lisa presented and that you'll find in this latest uh, UNICEF report, that that view of the world at large um, has some uh, immediate implications also for 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 Canadians and 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 colleagues, people around this call, operating at the national and 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 subnational levels. Let me let me start with kind of two stories of, of two two young girls. Um, one first was a nine-year-old girl uh, living in, in in England who who died in February 2013. She had severe asthma. Um, the last two years of her life were punctuated by severe asthma attacks that led to her collapse and admission to hospital almost 30 times. Her lungs collapsed or partially collapsed on five occasions. She struggled to to survive a form of asthma that flooded her lungs with fluid, and ultimately, um, she passed away. The other. A uh, young girl was only eight years old when she began to kind of understand the nature of the climate crisis that the planet was undergoing and really just couldn't understand why nobody was doing anything about it. The adults weren't doing anything about it. She was eight years old. Um, she fell into a depression as a consequence. Uh, by age 11, she'd stopped talking. It took her three, four years of struggle and multiple diagnoses of Asperger's, of OCD, of selective mutism before she came out of that period of darkness. Now I tell you these two stories um, because both of these children went on to transform the world and the world that we're kind of looking at in the context of this presentation, one in her life, one in, in her death in her own way. Um, the eight-year-old, of course, the second story and girl I introduced you to, I hope all of you know, this was Greta Thunberg, who uh, tomorrow will be marking her 198th week, that's 3.79 years, of her school strike for climate action um, and who has in many ways um, through her own example and the movement she's catalyzed around the world of children and others really kind of stepped up the advocacy and the action for urgent change in the environmental sustainability and the climate space. The other girl child who you may not have heard about is Ella Kissy Deborah. And why her story is important is that at the end of 2020, just as we were, the world was reeling from the pandemic, a London coroner made history by ruling that air pollution was one of the causes of Ella's death. Now, that was one small but significant and important step in a recognition of some of the consequences that environmental change, climate change, pollution is having on our lives. Almost a year late, less than a year later, October 2021, the UN Human Rights Council recognized the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, while the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child decided that a country can be held responsible for the impact of its emissions on children, both within and beyond its territory. So these are significant milestones that have been um, achieved. And again, these two figures, one in death, one in life, speak to why this Summer Institute topic is so critical and why Today's topic in particular on partnerships and capacities is in a sense, to my mind, the red thread that brings everything together from advocacy to research to lessons learned and best practices that the Institute's been looking at over the past few years. And this is for a number of reasons. One, because the challenges are greater than any single stakeholder. Second, because for every brilliant Fridays for Future activist, for every brilliant Greta Thunberg, Vanessa Nakate, and, and generations that have come even before them, there are still millions of children and youth who are either hapless victims of the problem that we have created or are clueless parts of the problem. And many of these problems and their solutions begin their impact in the womb and in terms of the nature and nurture that embraces and surrounds infants and very, very young children from the very, very get-go. Another reason is because as you all know, whatever is bad for people is worse for women and children 
And whatever is worse for women and children is absolutely awful for children zero to five and for other very marginalized communities. And the data proves that and backs that up on many, many metrics and, and, and measures. And ultimately why this matters is also because we really don't know enough, let alone enough at the nexus of early child development and environmental sustainability. And it's a space that requires a lot more scholarship and practice. So partnerships, communication strategies, participation strategies, advocacy, these are all strategies that have become essential where they were usually afterthoughts, nice to haves in simpler times. And having worked in this space for a long time, I know how much of a struggle it used to be to kind of invest in these supporting strategies. Whether you're a scholar or a practitioner today, the reality is in any field associated with children in the environment, children climate, children environmental sustainability, you seriously hinder your chances of impact if you're not actively an ambassador, a social entrepreneur, a champion of what Paulo Freire called praxis, that balance of reflection and action while also embracing consultation and study. And this is really because of the scope, the, the breadth, the depth, and crucially the interconnectedness of the crises that we face. And there are multiple crises. Even if I put aside some of the acute overlapping crises that we've been facing just over the past couple of years with the pandemic and even just over the past couple of months with the invasion of, of Ukraine, we really should be thinking about, and I want to sort of frame this for you at the broadest, kind of three major, let's say, zeitgeist issues or generational issues that should have our anxious concern and that speak to, again, this inter interconnectedness. And, and it's because they're interconnected that we need to be thinking about them and acknowledging them here, even if they go beyond the sort of the, the narrow subject matter of children and environment. Um, and it's because of this interconnectedness that I think you've really got a compelling case to be reaching out in a partnership context and engaging deeply um, across these different sectors and with each of these zeitgeist issues in a kind of woven, woven manner. Um, of course, I mean, the first crisis is, is the one that has, has brought us here together, and that's the environmental crisis. But that crisis in itself is, a, is, is three crises in one. You've got a climate crisis, you've got a biodiversity loss issue, and you've got a pollution issue. Very, very quickly in terms of, in terms of climate change, just on, on, the on the basics of sort of greenhouse gas emissions and keeping the temperature down to below 1.5 Celsius, which is the commitment the world made um, in Paris, we have put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere um, since the first episode of Seinfeld broadcast in the late 80s than at any other time in our history. And the implications of that, I'm sure you've seen as headline news, I won't get into it here, but the reality is this is very much our problem. It is an immediate problem, and it's a problem that needs our attention um, uh, yesterday, not today. From a biodiversity perspective, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, which is kind of the parallel to the IPCC that looks at climate change, their last report in 2019 suggested that an average of around 25 species in assessed animal and plant groups are threatened, suggesting that around a million species, one million species, are already in threat of facing extinction, many within decades unless action is taken. And this isn't, you know, an extinction uh, event that, you know, suggests we won't have elephants to look at in the future. This threatens our very livelihoods, our very, the economic basis, the agricultural basis of our food systems, of our, of our life systems. And then the pollution um, crisis, the third element of the environmental crisis, you know, again, just very recently, the Lancet uh, has issued um, a, a report on this in 2015, the, which they measured one in six deaths worldwide, we think about Ella, stemmed from poor air quality, unsafe water, and toxic chemical pollution, things that also the UNICEF report Lisa presented are looking at. This amounts to 9 million premature deaths a year, deaths from fossil fuel burning and lead poisoning, surprisingly have risen by 66% in the past two decades. Now, again, we know that anything that has an impact on people has an acute impact on the youngest children. So put these together and you've got the planet undergoing its sixth extinction event. And unlike the first five extinction events, one of which obliterated the dinosaurs, this one is entirely human-made. It's an anthropogenic extinction event. 
So that's the environmental crisis. But the second one that's deeply woven into this one, and, and you, you hear it in phrases like climate justice, is the crisis of inequality. And if our growing inequalities were bad before the pandemic, COVID-19 created an inequality catastrophe. Only 16.2% of people in low-income countries have received the first vaccine dose versus 82% who are fully vaccinated currently in Canada. The recovery from the crisis, again, taking a hit because of the Ukraine war, has been double-tracked. We've seen its implications um, in terms of poorer countries still struggling, richer countries almost bouncing, bouncing back. In the interest of time, again, there's a lot of examples that could be given, but we've seen its implications just also in terms of of, of children and education and, 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 and education of the youngest. Almost all countries provided some form of um, remote education during school closures, but there was high inequality in access and uptake between and within countries. Children from disadvantaged households were less likely to benefit from remote learning than their peers, often due to lack of electricity, connectivity, devices, caregiver support. Girls, students with disabilities, and the youngest children also face significant barriers engaging in remote learning. Overall, um, by the World Bank's estimates, at least a third of the world's school children, 463 million globally, were not, unable to access remote learning during school closures. And today, what we're seeing is 24 million additional students are at risk of not returning to the school system, even as schools open. And this has also implications on children's mental health deteriorating, risks of violence, child marriage, child labor, all of these situations in, increasing. And again, with dire implications for girls, dire implications for, for the youngest amongst us. And school disruptions, particularly, um, disrupted the youngest children. Early childhood education programs were closed the longest in many countries with limited or no support for remote learning. The implications, again, were also for children and the youngest children in terms of health, in terms of nutrition, and all of this, again, before the food, fuel, and fertilizer crisis that we're tackling now because of, again, the fallout of, of, of a war that is in Europe but has ramifications around the world and especially for the least developed, the poorest countries around the world. So that's the inequality crisis. The third crisis, which is, a, which is an interesting one, and, and to phrase it more as a challenge and a positive, is the challenge of how to vest power in citizens rather than elites. And this is really where some of the conversations and models that you've been hearing today, and, and I'm sure over the course of this institute, are really exciting. It's, it's a process that really kind of looks at how we fundamentally empower and bring agency back to ordinary people um, and allow, starting from the youngest, starting from the children, and through processes of participation, allow the solutions to kind of go back to communities, go back to, to the grassroots level, and work their way up all, all, all the way to the global level to really sort of affect changes. Because what we've seen as a trend is business elites taking over the work of changing the world. Many believe they're changing the world when they may instead or also be protecting a system that is the root of the problems they wish to solve. Uh, the economist Mariana Matsukato highlights, and I don't have data from Canada, but she talks about the US and UK, where only about a fifth of finance goes into what she calls the productive economy, such as companies that want to innovate or, or, or look, invest in infrastructure that needs building. The rest of it is going into fire that serves the elite, essentially, usually, which is finance, insurance, real estate. So again, this business of combating elitism is something that we see amongst youth movements and is, again, a zeitgeist issue that you that's going to take us forward as we kind of look at the challenges that we that we see. So I'm hoping that you can see these tightly interwoven crises or, or generational drivers create a web of issues that need serious collaborative solutions, serious partnerships, serious capacity, especially as we think on their implications for the youngest. Why is that? Again, so it's a range of things, and you've heard this from Ian, you've heard this from, 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 from others today and, and, and in the days before, I don't want to get into it, but again, just a few of the statistics. On average, today's kids spend up to 44 hours per week in front of a screen and less than 10 minutes a day playing outdoors. Now, again, playing is playing, but it's also transformational in so many other ways and is so important. More than 80% of the world's children live in urban areas and this trend continues to grow. So increasing safe, equitable access to nature is a strategy that enhances well-being. And again, we've seen that access is unequal and children from, and it's highly dependent on race, on income, identity, ability, and essentially your postal code. So again, 
not to get into some of the benefits of engagement for young children um, that, that come from access to nature, that come from environmental awareness education. These I, I'm, I'm sure we've talked about, but the benefits inside investing in children's knowledge, attitudes, practices, behaviors, beliefs about the environment from the early years is now a matter of survival from a climate action perspective. The transformations that we need in systems and values and, and social norms required to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, including the social, economic impacts, as well as impacts on well-being, requires investments from the earliest years. And there's, again, a limited but growing body of evidence sort of backing this up. There was a 2019 study of over 100 children in upstate New York that found that environmental attitude and behavior form around age seven, increase until age 10, level off until age 14, and then decline again until the age of 18. We need to address attitudes and behaviors jointly. This is a key, key insight that's coming forward. Another study by the Sustainability Education Research Institute suggests that social learning and place-based place pedagogies are critical for learning about climate change and that climate change education should focus on four learning dimensions, two of which really are interesting and I don't know that we think about in the school or in the classroom. So it's the cognitive, it's the socio-emotional dimensions, but also the action-oriented dimension and the justice-focused dimension. And here's, I think, again, for me, as I was thinking about this, why where the urgency of partnership-centric, multi-stakeholder solutions becomes almost non-negotiable. While it's easy to place the onus of children's environmental education on, on formal education duty bearers and school systems, research, including the same study that I just cited, suggests that that is massively inadequate. While these dimensions mostly refer to the content of what's being taught, the report, the, the study that I cited emphasizes that if climate change is only taught within the classroom or, or, or strictly speaking in, 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 as an academic subject, it leads students to believe that climate change can only be solved through scientific or technical solutions. They'll simply reduce climate change to an academic problem that needs to be solved and will forget about the social and political dimensions of the problem. So I think that's why, again, we're seeing climate change education look at other aspects of students' experience. And that, again, means we need other partners investing in these aspects and comes back to the centrality of partnership strategies, communication strategies. The complexity of the challenge, especially when it comes to promoting connectedness to nature and environmental stewardship amongst the youngest children, demands approaches that mobilize every sector, the public sector, the private sector, and the citizen sector. And crucially, it needs recognition that there are three constituent participants in the process, at least a couple of which any given stakeholder is comfortable with or thinks about. Everybody really thinks about institutions and their accountability in this, in this business. But we need to be thinking non-traditional actors, including in the ECD space, including in looking at environmental awareness raising amongst the young children. We need to be looking at urban planning, governance, the, the, whole, the whole set. Another key stakeholder in is, is individuals. And a lot of sort of the campaigning and communication work and awareness raising work that we do goes into targeting individuals um, and, and, and their, their particular behaviors. But where kids, and especially the youngest kids are now concerned, is they look at and observe the behavior of, of the elders. And so the issue of hypocrisy, the issue of our words matching our deeds becomes vital as we consider how we invest in and bring individuals to the table, looking at investments in children from the youngest year ages. So we need highly conscientized and actively committed individuals serving as CEOs, administrators, teachers, down to our baristas in our, in our coffee shops. And so that age of big words, small deeds, which was important to get things going, um, is now over, certainly in the sense of being, building the next generation of, of people who are aware of these things. The third constituent participant, I think, is somewhat underutilized, and I'm excited to hear some of the examples from today, and that is the community. Um, in whatever, and we struggle to, to engage the community, certainly as large bureaucracies in the UN system or the World Bank, but I think the examples at national, subnational, all the way down to local level are important. In whatever definition, we need community partners at the table, starting with the frontline workers of community who are parents. Greta and Ella's stories that I presented really are as much the stories of their parents, who and especially Greta's parents, who transformed their own lives. Uh, a mother who was a rising opera star who gave up flying 
to be able to sort of really support her daughter, changed radically their behaviors. This is really what has given young children the reality that there is a possibility and a hope for a future that is different and that is better. One of the very powerful community groups is, is faith groups, faith actors. And we need those faith actors to be inspiring these changes from a very, very young age in the ways that they engage their constituents and their communities well. And so this kind of intimate connection between the spiritual and the material is something that is crucial if we're able to take these solutions to a viable future that is beyond sort of technological solutions. So that's where, again, and Isabel mentioned silos, it's interesting, we need to be really breaking down these silos as we as we go forward. We talk a lot about breaking silos down in, in, in businesses and bureaucracies, but in an environmental space, it sometimes suited us to say, well, we're looking at this as civil society and business is over there and business is bad and, and, and so on and so forth. So bringing these sectors together right now is an imperative because without that, without that kind of partnership context, I don't think the solutions are going to lend themselves to what we need as we move forward. Because what we need is to come together to create entirely new patterns of economic activity decoupled from growing environmental degradation, growing inequality, and a degradation in processes of civic participation. And so I think the work that you all do with children in their earliest years has always fundamentally been about rights, the rights to health, the rights to education, to equality, to production, to protection. Now, I think more than ever, um, it is also about the right child's right to tomorrow. And I think that is really um, where, where we have our agenda cut out for us as we move, move ahead. Um, thank you. Let me, let me stop there, Bernice. Thank you. That was very powerful and, again, resonated on so many levels. Uh, what I was really struck by is your comment about how, you know, we need to see the kind of connections between the environment, inequality, and other issues, you know, the three um, kind of large buckets that you identified. And, you know, I, I do a lot of work around anti-racism, anti-oppression, and uh, it, it reminded me of a quote by Angela Davis, which I believe, you know, she said sometime in the, in the 90s, so, you know, not recent. But before progress can be made on social issues like gender inequality and racism, work needs to be done to ensure the planet is sustainable enough for humans to even exist. So, you know, really captures, I think, what you were, what you're stating. So, um, again, lots of, uh, you know, lots to chew on, lots of um, information this morning that was, really, that was presented that um, really compels us to think about, again, you know, these partnerships, as you said, that are critical to this work. We can't do this alone. Um, this is um, something that, um, again, takes, you know, um, collective um work to do, um, a collective commitment. Um, so thank you for that. So um, I'm inviting all our panelists to return and we'll address some of the questions um, that have um, percolated. Uh, so I'm gonna go to the question and answer box. So first of all, there's a comment from Christine, not a question, however, just gratitude for the homework. We do not know this, but having it land end on your story, having it land end on your story makes me so mindful to implement and partake in this beautiful idea for self-reflection. I think that's directed at you, Dr. Denard. Um, another question, and again, directed for you, uh, Dr. Denard, thank you very much for your powerful presentation. Could you speak more to how the seven stages counters Western or Piaget? notions of development in the early years, please. I have been doing some reading about this, but they do not give the real life accounts you gave such as people transitioning to the next stage when they lose their baby teeth. So maybe we'll pause and um, think about that if you wanna to respond to that. Yeah, um, I'll go back to my feather here. <laughs> Simple feather teaching. Um, so, you know, I, I actually just did a presentation on the seven stages of life yesterday and it took four hours, but I will try to do the Cole's note mini version of that. So this is, this is representative of what you call the lodge of life. So if you imagine this part is before we have a physical vessel to come in here, that we're, we are of spirit. 
Um, that is part of our, our traditional teachings and our own creation story. So that first stage of life, that good life. Um, and yes, if I just quickly answer the question in our, in the seven stages of life teaching, um, we go through seven stages of life before we leave this lodge of life, that first life, that first stage being the good life. There's also a grandfather teachings, which is our values and principles of being Anishinaabe. And that first stage, I always think about wisdom um, because we're born so wise. And yes, as our as our baby teeth fall out, we we go into that next stage of life, which is the fast life as teenagers, when everything's coming fast at us, our body's changing, we're getting taller. Um, I think of that stage of, of life as reflecting the grandfather teaching of love, because it is a time when, and you know, the joke I make about that is that if you can love a teenager, you can love anybody because they are in that rebel and challenging stage of life. But we need to go through that because that next stage of life is the wandering and wondering stage. And um, also just reflecting on the teenager again, um, thinking about maybe even again, your own self as a teenager, or the challenges that our young people are having right now. It's also an important time for that grandfather understanding, not just how we as adults love those, are able to love those teenagers as they're going through their, their rebel and challenging stage, but also um, that we support them in a way that they have uh, built an understanding of how they're able to love themselves, especially through the their own oppression, because I, I find that many young people feel completely oppressed. Um, for for whatever voice that they have, that wandering and wandering stage, that time of life when we venture off, um, maybe go to university, different parts of the world, go to find work, maybe we follow a relationship somewhere uh, to be with somebody. Um, that wandering and wandering stage is very much a part of um, having that courage to leave our family and our home, but also those ones that took care of us, the courage for them to know that they had given um, those young people everything that they need to. Um, find that next stage of life, their own truth, that truth of who we are, that's represented by that fire, that center and um, that relationality that we have um, with the light. Because as we know, um, I guess even scientifically, that darkness can exist without light, but light cannot exist without darkness. There's a, that's that duality that we have. Um, that next stage of life after we come to that truth stage is that planning and planting stage where we might want to um, take responsibility for younger ones and uh, either having our own children or, or perhaps taking care of other children ourselves and doing that work in the community. That next stage, um, well, that and that stage is represented by um, being um, having respect and understanding that relationality of respect. The next one being um, that teaching stage, um, that humility. Um, of being able to do that work and share. And then that last stage of life, that um, that spirit, that pure teacher, uh, many people call those elders. And as you can see, they're getting at that stage of life. If we're, if we're able to continue our full life path um, on the path of Mina Bumadzuin, uh as we enter leaving that door where we transition out through the Western doorway. So this is also goes from East to West in this, in this teaching. And so when I talk about um, this life path and what was left, those ones that went ahead of us and those ones coming behind us, um, we know that there's challenges and struggles. And so we, we try to, as wherever present moment that we are to think about what are those things that will help our young people um, still continue to find meaning, still continue to find um, purpose in this life. And, and as I'm listening today, you know, with all of these, uh, climate changes, all these things, you know, that be becomes seemingly um, increasingly more challenging to, um, I guess, also even think in those contradictions, like here we have, oh, are, we're going to be extinct soon to what can we do in this present moment? So I think that, um, you know, it's been an interesting conversation. I hope, uh, Shawnee, I was able to sum up <laughs> that as quickly as I, as I could. Um, and, you know, just, again, I'm going to uh, say one thing, repeat one thing, and which is um, in the conversations about the stakeholders and the partnerships, I want to ensure that um, I comment that the, the biggest 
partner and the biggest stakeholder that we need to develop a reciprocity and relationship, aka please do your homework, is with the land. And hopefully that will set our thinking in that original way. What is she trying to teach us? Because I think she still continues to try to sing, sustain um, life despite uh, the human uh, interactions that we have created um, that are unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, setting us in this particular conversation in particular. Okay, miigwech. Thank you. That was really helpful. And I'm uh, sure that uh, there's an opportunity for people to follow up and do some more reading and learning, as you suggested. Um, but it reminded me of an, it kind of connects to another question that I um, that I see um, has cropped up. And I'm thinking, again, we keep talking about children. So um, you talked about coming into this world, Dr. Denard, you know, full of wisdom. And um, so, you know, the question to the panelists is, is there space for children as partners? Today, you know, the focus is on partners. We love a lot of early child educators, practitioners, researchers, policy folks in the audience. So I'll start with you, Nason. What do you think? Is there space for children as partners? How, what, what, that, what might that look like? I mean, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think the uh, the answer is a is a resounding yes, and I, and and I think one way to think about this also is, you know, in in the context of children, partnership becomes a euphemism in a sense for participation, and the 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 child's right to participation in the processes that impacts their lives to their capacity. Uh, as per their age, which is enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, as well. And this was, in fact, one of the uh, key recommendations coming out of the Innocenti Center report card that Lisa from UNICEF presented as well, which was to involve children who are ultimately the main stakeholders of, of the future. Um, it's also something that we've seen, you know, my team at the bank kind of runs a trust fund called Connect for Climate that also has a, a the, the Youth for Climate program and ahead of the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC last year, we convened 400 um, young people from around the world to consult and deliberate and take a message to Glasgow, to the COP in, in Glasgow. And it was really um, astonishing the extent to which they are, you know, demanding, advocating for, pleading for climate literacy, climate education that goes beyond awareness raising, um, banging the pots, but really substantively from, from the earliest years through to university education and sort of moves forward. So young people themselves are demanding that there are spaces and, and approaches for them to be engaged in partnering with participating in the processes that develop these, these kinds of things. There's studies also that really sort of show and again, um, advocate for engaging young people, not just in action, but also as co-researchers in environmental education research. Now, again, participation is something that, you know, I, I find very useful to kind of think about Roger Hart's kind of ladder of participation. Um, and we got to, we have to be careful about this. There's conferences are dime a dozen, everybody, it's kind of in vogue to bring young people and hear young people's voices, but you drag them in, you give them two minutes and then you walk them out. So, you know, going from kind of to tokenism, um, you know, decorative or manipulative modes of non-participation to kind of the more meaningful, you know, higher order means where really you've got child-led processes that bring in adults is key. And it's what we've seen very excitingly in things like the Fridays for Future movement. Um, and really understanding the core message of the Fridays for Future movement and its protagonists like Greta Thunberg, Vanessa Nakate from Uganda is really, you know, humbling because they're not out there just saying, you know, the houses and fire adults do something. Their core message is always follow the science. They are incredibly committed to the science and to the research and and the and and looking pragmatically at the solutions rather than turning this into kind of just a, a purely emotive uh, emotive issue which which again speaks to the depth that they can bring when they are brought to the table um as as partners thank you for that um I'm also uh, seeing in the chat, there was a response about uh, the question uh, related to the seven stages. So I'm not sure that Anishinaabe seven stages compare well with Piaget, not just apples and oranges, apples and stars. There are laws that are being broken, not the human laws, human bureaucracies are breaking the natural laws. So just pointing that out. Thank you. 
Um, another question um, for, uh, we'll start with uh, Ian this time. What did you find to be the most compelling argument principle to engage community partners to pay attention to tackle action to be involved in greening and environmental action. I, and again, I, you know, it's, it's, it's been coming up all week, this notion of engaging the community and, and uh, you know, again, this collective action and partnerships building on those capacities. So if you could uh, respond to that, Ian. I don't know if I understand it uh, uh, right or totally, but can you, can you say it once, please? So I guess the question is, what did you find the most compelling argument or principle? I guess what they're trying to ask is, how did you engage community partners? How did you get them to really pay attention and take action to be involved in greening and environmental action? What were some of the strategies, or I guess? Or how did you compel them to, to do this work with you? Um, I think it's... Uh, difficult to just talk about uh, these uh, things and I think it's really important to bring people to uh, places where you're talking about so they can feel they can understand and they uh, use all their sentences and uh, not only uh, their minds and I think everyone is connected with nature and uh, will uh, there's a fire inside what uh, will go on then. I see it with uh, children, with uh, their adults, etc. And um, I don't know the English word, but you you have to have an experience to also have that perspective. And many uh, people don't have the perspective, so they don't know uh, what to choose. Yes, um, we're all impacted, you're right, and it's to help them to understand the importance, the significance, and, and their role. The, yeah. The, the referential uh, box, or I don't know the English word, but I'm sorry. The frame. Maybe perhaps are you suggesting the frame? Yes. For, uh, yeah, go ahead, Nathan. You look like. You sorry, just just very quickly, if I might add to to Ian's response here to Beth's question, I'm, I, I I suppose the safest answer is to say it depends on sort of which partner or stakeholder you're engaging with, but what in in general terms we've found very helpful, and and you know especially when we kind of sit and look, at, you know, with ministries of environment and representatives to the UN Environment Assembly, so on, is that the nexus issues are tend to be um, highly resonant. What most universally appeals is the, the health environment nexus. The minute people can personalize that this is about the health of their children, the well-being of the children, they, they, they sit up. For a lot of parliamentarians, we have a network that we engage with here at the World Bank of Parliamentarians from around the world. Jobs, green jobs, green growth becomes, again, kind of an entry point to start thinking about some of these issues. So finding those entry points in terms of the, dependent on the particular constituents, key stakeholders is, is key. I mean, we again, um, you know, Debbie's mentioned the land and the connection to the land. This is vital for indigenous communities around the world, environmental defenders around the world who are giving their lives for this. This is a deadly business for, for many communities around the world in places from, from, from the Amazon to the Congo Bay and so on. So looking at those entry points and those kind of nexus points really turns this around where sometimes just talking about the world is heating up turns people off or they, they, they switch off. They feel it's an issue larger than them or an institutional challenge where they have less agency. Yes, thank you for that. It's, it's, it's true health, right? It impacts all of us. So there's no ignoring that. Uh, there's no escaping that. Uh, Dr. Dyer, did you want to respond to that question? And then I think we're we're out of time. Again, such great conversation and, and enlightening presentations. Was that a pass? I'm just I'm trying to think of <clears throat> um, what I could add to this conversation. I I um you know, I came into this conversation being like, oh, yeah, I really want to share what it and I'm having sometimes I have a little bit of a contradiction only because at one time before the settlers came here, this was considered such an abundant place. And my ancestor had taken care of this for 
since time immemorial. So I, I do have these, I, some of these are my own questions because I believe that in such a short period of time, um, within our, even our own families, maybe in our own histories that, you know, I remember being able to drink the water from the lake um, 50 years later, maybe even 45 years later, I'm like telling my kids to run away from the lake and don't drink it. And, um, you know, so this, the great question is, and, and I guess it's the question back because I see, um, a return to, you know, I'm looking at Ian's amazing what they're doing. And, and I'm thinking about when I was a child and I had that. And now suddenly two generations of maybe my grandchildren won't have that unless it's constructed. I'm like, it kind of, you know, there's a contradiction here in my own being. So I feel like I want to put that back to people who are, whether it's economic or whether it's social, like <clears throat> that's such a good question because I know in my own community, there's many of my, we didn't have water till 1978, which, you know, and we, we know in first nations and in, in this part of uh Turtle Island that there still continues to be communities without drinking water. So I also have that question as a First Nation person, where are these? Because sometimes I feel like even in these spaces, oh, you know, when I say it, oh, I have no drinking water and this has to in our, our lives of our children and our social determinants of health and all, oh, that angry Indian lady talking about all these things. And you know, I come into this space and I'm grateful that, you know, even wanting to know more about our way of life and our way of thinking. But, you know, I also do. I mean, I feel like I'm going to put the question back again because I, I keep because I do have this contradiction in my thinking, even though I'm I'm grateful to be here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to spending more time tomorrow to maybe unpack some of that thinking that may get into policy. But, yeah, I would. If if you know the answer, I'd be, I'd be happy to share it with my First Nations communities that continue to be denied certain human rights um, because we because we fit under a, a different uh, status or something, or we're not even considered Canadian citizens because we people chose not to assimilate or enfranchise. So yeah, I'm looking forward to yeah. When you figure that out and answer some of these questions, I'm happy to go back to my own communities and share, oh, well, this is what they're trying because we've been political since the 1970s and we've been, I feel like we've been fighting for our rights for a very long time. So if you have an answer to how to get this going, um, yeah, I'll be happy to share that back because I feel like I have been a political activist and a social activist my entire life. And I don't, I don't really, I feel like I have a hard time myself being able to answer that question because I have been resisted um, within those structures and within those institutions. Yeah, no, fair enough. I hear that. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it continues to be an uphill battle. And, and every time, you know, how do we move the needle without the needle running away from us? Like, how do we get closer to that? So, you know, one of the, I guess the last question um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're getting uh, close to time here, but Nason, I guess uh, the question is, could, uh, what are the three things policymakers could do to build green early childhood uh, care system to build a green early learning and child care system? So if you had a couple of thoughts in two minutes, no pressure. Would it, um, great, great question. I, you know, I, I think I, I, you know, a, a couple of immediate things. One is to really kind of breathe in very, very deeply the um, the, the the science and the, the 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 realities of wherever it is that you're operating, whatever that context is, and to bring in sort of the maximum possible level. Of, of participation and input from the various constituent participants um, in the process at that at that local level, be it young people, be it children, be it uh, 
uh, indigenous communities, be it um, whatever the different stakeholders are. That That is a crucial process. It's a process that's now been enshrined in every project of the World Bank that it gets delivered around the world in, in over 140 countries. So that participatory process anchored in the science and the and the exigencies of a location is crucial. One of the commitments the World Bank Group, for example, has made to the, the in, in its climate change action plan, um, the, the, the second one, it's a five-year climate change action plan, is the development of, of CCDR's climate um, uh, change and development reports that really kind of looks deeply at each national context where we operate and delivers policy recommenda recommendations for transformative um, actions that countries can take within their local contexts, be it um, related to their uh, nationally determined commitments, their voluntary commitments in the Paris Agreement, or 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 otherwise, which I think is which I think is 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 crucial. Um, there's you know the, again just a, a, a range of other kind of things that you know we're, we're seeing in a number of recommendations that um, the even the UNICEF report makes. Um, you know from focusing on children um, now to protect to, you know to protect the future. I'm looking at the report to improving environments for the most vulnerable children that focus on, on, on the most marginalized popula populations, ensuring that environmental policies are child sensitive, uh, being attuned to that process, the participation of young children in the processes, and then really the whole business of taking global, global responsibility and ensuring that responsibility uh, translates in terms of uh, ESG commitments, uh, governance, social environmental commitments on the, on the business side as well. Thank you. Um, again, I, you know, what I think I've learned through these last few days is this is a uh, very complex, although should be um, quite obvious, um, shouldn't be as difficult, but yet it is. And for a number of different reasons, and there's so many, you know, uh, I, you know, I think, you know, the bureaucracy is a good is a good word that demonstrates some of the struggle to, to do this and, and move forward. But I thank everyone, again, really compelling, really um, uh, information that requires deep thought and reflection. Um, at this point, I'm not going to say much more because of interest of time. It is um, my now privilege to introduce uh, Faye Lim Labrini, who is our um, Dean for Health Sciences and Center for Center for Health Sciences and Center for Community Services and Early Childhood at George Brown College in Toronto. Uh, Faye has extensive experience in the hospital, government, and social services sector, as well as demonstrated leadership in post-secondary education. The former Dean of Health, Wellness, and Sciences at George and College, Faye has held practice and education leadership out of oversight of health disciplines in nursing, oral health, social work, therapeutic recreation, occupational therapy and assistance, physiotherapy and assistance, paramedics, personal support workers, pharmacy and pharmacy technicians. Clearly, you know, understands the importance of this work as well and, you know, how it intersects again with uh, social determinants of health, um, no doubt. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Faye, to introduce um, our award recipients. Thank you so much, uh, Bernice, and greetings, everyone. We are delighted to be recognizing Julie Comey, Doug Anderson, and Lorraine Tiarotto for their contribution to the field of early childhood through the publication of their beautifully written book, Natural Curiosity, second edition. The first edition of this resource was published in 2011 with a goal of introducing an inquiry-based approach to environmental education with young children. The approach was shaped by children, questions about nature and the land, in effect, their natural curiosities about the environment. In the second edition, the authors, fueled by recommendations by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, sought to strengthen environmental inquiry with indigenous perspectives. As the authors say, the indigenous lens opens our eyes to transformative possibilities for practice. We can affirm that this resource has helped to open the eyes of not only the educators in our lab schools and the hundreds of students in our programs, but it has helped to open the eyes of students and educators across the country. 
and in doing so, has brought Indigenous perspectives into the heart of Canadian educational settings in terms of environmental learning for young children and educators. We are honoured to present this award of excellence to Julie Comey, Doug Anderson, and Lorraine Pierotto. Thank you. Um, I think uh, it, someone had said it was, we, we would just say a few words, I guess now's the time. <laughs> so uh, Julie, did you want to say something first? And Go ahead. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's so, so wonderful to have this book uh, recognized through your award. And it's just such an honor. And I, I just want to say it's an, it's a big honor because I think the early childhood education in light of uh, Dr. Deb's um, sharing of the, of the Reader's Digest version <laughs> of the, the seven stages of life um, means that if we were really able to spend time with that, which we aren't of course today, um, the implications would be that we, we would actually have a very different approach to just about everything we do. And so the book, I would say it's not so much bringing an Indigenous perspective into um, environmental education as placing an Indigenous perspective alongside um, a look at an, an environmental education. And what I'm really looking forward to and where, where I think we're at right now is asking how they may come to work together over time in, in really profound ways. Um, and I want to just end my grateful <laughs> acceptance words uh, I think I have like one minute left by sharing um, I don't know if you could call it a teaching but just something that was shared with me by one of our uh, elders her name's Diane Longboat she's an educator from uh, I believe she's from Six Nations and she spent time with learning ministries and that's, that's her thing and she said we're actually breaking certain kinds of laws consistently and have have done for some time and the way she put it is is, is if we were um uh really living according to the ways in which small children are gifted to us then they would be at the center of everything and we would be sort of surrounding them with the caretakers whether they're men or women or grandparents and then on the outside of that circle would be the adult uh, men and women who are who are who are rushing around trying to gather uh, the materials from the worlds we're in in order to support those sacred beings, and uh, we've got the we've got the reverse. All our systems, all our bureaucracies are asking how um, the men and women, the adult men and women who are consuming the world and eating it up, are in the center of everything. They're the center of our concerns, and we've placed the older people and the children off to the side. And I, I'm not saying that to critique um, ECEs or teachers in schools. They're the noblest professions in this time we're in. Um, and what I'm interested in sharing is that as we do look at how this lens, this Indigenous lens may come closer, we don't know if it can, but it may come closer to environmental education. What we're really challenged to do is to, um, is to kind of almost invert our focus. Um, and to bring a lot more support to people who are spending that time with the children, um, teachers and ECE people. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've seen children even to this day. I mean, this happened to me, but I've seen children to this day in daycares uh, who are infants who are lined up in cribs. Something's wrong. Something's wrong there. And so in the kinds of things that, that Dr. Depp has been sharing are, are, I mean, I mentioned it's like comparing apples and stars because she's actually coming from a place that is bringing this perspective into, into a place where it's standing beside what you're doing. And it's challenging us all to, to begin to um, surround teachers and ECEs with all our knowledge. We need to put you in the middle and then get all the sort of forces of our systems to, to surround you. And I'm, I'm, I, that's a big thing to say, but we are working on that. Uh, we're going to be bringing the, the, uh, the universities, for example, to uh, <laughs> the work that, and the questions that the children are bringing forward and that they need answered. 
um, in some, some of the research we're doing. So keep doing what you're doing, everybody, because you have, for me, uh, and, and for I think a lot of us who are, who are not necessarily working with the smallest children, you have the most important job of all. So, so thank you for your work and thank you for this honor. And uh, Julie, did you have something to, to add or? It's always hard to follow you, Doug. Um, and Lorraine. Don't talk too much. <laughs> no, that's great. I, you know, I've always, one, one thing, like I first started coming to this conference probably in the early 2000s. I don't know when it started, but, um, and I always kind of loved the way there was this kind of natural bringing together of, you know, the very academic side of things, the theory, the research with policy, and then these very pragmatic perspectives of on the ground teachers in classrooms. And it's kind of unusual, actually, to see this. And it spoke very well to my kind of lifetime of straddling these different wor worlds. Um, and today, really, the talks particularly resonated with me because we're out of town looking after, in the daytime, our year and a half old grandson, who we see just beginning, really finding his voice, especially the power of saying no, and um, kind of imagine this world whose future is kind of scarily difficult to fully take in. So I was... I was very, I found the talks poignant in that way. As Doug says, it's a real honor to be here. It's very pleasing to think that natural curiosity is something that teachers might actually find useful, even though like it has a total lack of lesson plans or scripted activities or, you know, it doesn't tell you what to do. Um, and really, I just want to say, um, that the book couldn't exist without the absolutely essential contributions of sort of incredible educators from all over. And, you know, that includes people in academia, but also like a, mostly from communities of one sort or another. And, um, you know, I'm really honored to be here kind of on their behalf as well. And uh, Laureen, who is the the real grandmother of the book, she needs to say something. Thank you, Julie. Um, I am I on mute? No. Nope? Okay, good. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say that I am truly, truly humbled to be in the company of everybody here. Um, I, I see natural curiosity at, at, at the very beginning being a, a seed that we didn't know how it would grow. Uh, but 11 years later, thanks to the tremendous and necessary contributions of Doug and Julie adding the Indigenous lens uh, to what we were working through with inquiry-based environmental education, and as Julie mentioned, the contributions of educators in so many different communities, it, it really speaks to, I think, the importance of a collective coming together of knowledge. And that's really what I appreciate about this conference, about today, um, and about the way in which um, natural curiosity has evolved over more than a decade. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really, really humbled to be here. And, and thank you. Thank you for this honor. Wonderful. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you so much, Faye, and uh, to Julie, Doug, and Lorraine for being present today. Um, I can speak firsthand at the many ways in which uh, this resource has served our uh, staff, our educators, and our students. So, um, and I know I've met you on various occasions over the years uh, through uh, various teachings and um, when you've brought uh, brought people together. And Julie, you know, thank you for acknowledging that the the institute is, you know almost 20 years old. And when you made that comment about how unusual it is for researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to come together from across sectors, I have to share with you that it was the late Dr. Fraser Mustard who actually challenged us to do that. 
He said it will, we're only going to be able to move forward if we move across silos, um, when we bring health and education and uh, social work and policymakers and um, urban plant. When, when, when we think about this as a large community of uh, researchers, planners, thinkers, and doers, that we all need to be, get, be together in the room. And it was he actually who challenged all of us to do that, to come together in this way. So um, how thoughtful of you to notice that. and Because we hadn't even thought about it anymore because it's sort of what we've been doing for the last 20 years. And uh, it, it's terrific to see how, uh, how diverse the audience and participants are compared to the first year when we were mostly educators in the room. And, um, and Dr. Fraser must challenge us to, uh, to think differently about the ways in which we come together to um, share research, think about policy, and be inspired by how uh, practice informs both. Um, so we have spent the last few days together really focusing on the impact of climate change and how what it had the impact it has on young children around the world. And all of the presenters have been compelling in their conviction about how critical it is that environmental sustainability is embedded in every aspect of early years. And while the reports um, and the report cards presented um, you know, are distressing. Um, you know, the the research policy and practice presentations that followed um, allow us to be optimistic about the possibilities of a better future as we commit um, to working together in responding to this, this call of action. The teachings that the presenter shared about indigenous perspectives in respect for and learning from the land provide guidance for us all. For as Dr. Dunner declared, the children indeed are watching. Um, so as researchers, policymakers, educators, and global citizens, um, we, we need to com commit to continuing to, um, to doing the work that we're all committed to doing. Um, we certainly hope that the Institute has uh, helped to serve as a bit of a booster. <laughs> You know, as we continue in the work ahead, you know, as uh, Nissan has, you know, declared, uh, we need to do this to um, to ensure the child's rights of a tomorrow. We are very grateful to all our presenters and our panelists and uh, and our moderators and and to all of you for carving out the time uh, to come together to really think more deeply and learn with and through one another. Um, we'd like to thank our partners at OISE, at the University of Toronto, at uh, my colleagues at George Brown College and the Centre of Excellence in Quebec, and of course our funders, the Atkinson Foundation, the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation, the Lawson Foundation. Um, and I am thrilled to be joined by all these partners. I realized I probably should have said that my name is Patricia Twenty Rubin and the director of the School of Early Childhood. I was just so excited by all that has already taken place. So thank you to all of you uh, who have joined us these last few days. Um, I know people have been asking about where some of the presentations will be available. They'll be posted shortly on the Atkinson Center. Um, and we know that we're gonna to continue to do some work around um, a policy brief. Um, and, uh, and that as well will be posted on the Atkinson um, site. So this is, I guess, an official way of closing this year's Summer Institute and thanking all. Looking forward to working in partnership with um, many of you uh, as we go forward. And we truly look forward to hopefully, fingers crossed, seeing you in person. As, uh, as exciting as these last two years of virtual <laughs> uh, conferences, Ben, we do indeed look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, next year in person. So with much thanks, bye-bye for now. Bye.